My name is Jeffrey Myron. I'm a senior lecturer in economics at Harvard University. I'm also the director of economic studies at the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian think tank in Washington, DC. A little bit of history. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, but mainly grew up in Arlington, Virginia. I attended Swarthmore College, where I studied economics and math, then got a PhD in economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I've had faculty positions at the University of Michigan, at Boston University, uh, and now at Harvard University. My area of expertise is the economics of libertarianism, and in particular, the economics of illegal drugs and of drug prohibition versus legalization. The statement that governments often do more harm than good, even when they have good intentions, is really just like the statement that some types of medical interventions do more harm than good, even though doctors are certainly trying to help their patients. Because both, in both cases, economic policy interventions and medical interventions, there are unintended consequences. Unintended consequences of surgery can include getting an infection, and some infections are very dangerous and can actually kill the patient, even for relatively minor surgeries. In the case of economic policies, the unintended consequences come from the fact that whenever governments intervene, they change the costs and benefits of the different activities, and they change incentives that the agents in the economy face, the consumers and the businesses. And sometimes that leads to outcomes that nobody wanted, that nobody thought about. To give a simple example that illustrates, when Congress wanted to protect endangered species in the United States, it passed something called the Endangered Species Act. And that says that property owners can't develop their property after the government has discovered the existence of an endangered species on that property. So in response, many property owners have decided that they would develop their properties, cut down all the trees and so on, before the government had a chance to discover an endangered species. And that way, they would always have the ability to use their property for development, for houses, for shopping malls, and things like that, and not take the risk that their ability to use their property might be limited at some later date if an endangered species was discovered. That's not the intended consequence of that act, but it might, in fact, mean the act kills species more often than it actually saves species. And in the libertarian view, or the economic view, those types of unanticipated consequences occur widely and sometimes are very significant, much more significant than the benefits that the programs create. So consequential libertarianism just means a kind of approach that focuses on the costs and benefits, on all the effects that a given government intervention might have. The intended ones, the unintended ones, the good ones, the bad ones, pros and cons, costs and benefits. It's similar to economic libertarianism. It's sometimes referred to as practical or pragmatic libertarianism. And it's a different approach, at least in terms of the language it uses, to rights-based libertarianism, which roughly says government policy shouldn't intervene, we shouldn't do most of the things that governments currently do because they interfere with individual rights, with individual liberties. So the two ways of describing the libertarian view, the small government view, sound very different. It turns out they come to approximately the same conclusions, which suggests maybe they have a, more in common than appears at first glance. I think they do because the rule of thumb don't interfere with individual rights, turns out to be a very good way of not causing unintended consequences. Anarchists, again, roughly speaking, think that we should have zero government. Libertarians are not advocating for zero government. They're advocating for much, much smaller government than we currently have, for a very limited government, but not for zero. The two main areas that libertarians, where libertarians support government are national defense, having some degree of a military that protects the country from attack by other countries and the like, and a criminal justice system, a contract enforcement system that protects people against basically violence by others and theft by others, and that allows people to have contracts enforced in a reasonable and nonviolent way. But other than that, libertarians would hardly endorse more than a teeny handful of all the remaining things that governments currently do. So relative to where we are now, it's perfectly understandable that to many people, libertarianism and anarchy sound approximately the same, but they're different in a very important way. Libertarians think the role of the state in the economy should be quite small. It should basically be enforcing property rights, deciding which 
claims on different kinds of property, both physical property, perhaps intellectual property, and so on, should be protected and how it should be protected. So that includes laws against murder and theft and related things like arson or robbery and so on. Uh, it includes enforcing civil contracts between different parties, the buyers and sellers of a house or uh, two different businesses that want to transact goods between themselves or between them and their customers. But in a libertarian view, that is essentially all that is, that is useful, that the other types of interventions that go beyond that, most regulation, okay, most redistribution of income, maybe all redistribution of income, that those are, back to the earlier conversation, causing more harm than good. It's not that they don't generate any benefits. They certainly often provide benefits for some people, okay, subsidies for farmers. They help farmers but they help farmers at the cost of everyone else. The money that's given to farmers to pay them not to grow as many crops comes from everybody else in the economy and raises the prices for goods for everybody else in the economy. So standard economics, and certainly libertarians as well, would argue that those subsidies, agricultural subsidies, are a bad idea because the net harm is greater than any net positive. Laws that protect workers' rights or employment rights are going to tend to help some employees at the expense of other employees, and they're typically going to impose costs on the businesses that hire those employees. And so libertarians and many economists would oppose them. Take a really simple example of the minimum wage. The minimum wage will tend, uh, certainly in the short run, to raise the wages of some people, of those people who retain their jobs in their existing businesses. But it also has a tendency to cause fewer to people to be employed, or to have a firm reduce the number of hours at which it's willing to hire its employees because the businesses that are subject to these minimum wage laws are going to respond to those minimum wage laws. They're going to adopt by substituting machines for employees. They might adapt by substituting high-skilled employees for a larger number of low-skilled employees. They might adapt by moving to a different location that doesn't have as high a minimum wage. In some cases, if the minimum wage is too high, their only choice of adaption is to go out of business because the minimum wage raises their cost at the point where they can't be profitable. So are the businesses helped? Almost certainly not. The businesses would do those things on their own if they were in the interest of the businesses. Are they helping employees? Occasionally, or sorry, I should say sometimes, yes, for some employees, but not overall because those adjustments have to come from somewhere, and frequently they're going to come from those employees who are harmed by the particular uh, interventions. I study the economics of illegal drug markets, and in particular, I'm interested in the question of whether it's better to outlaw drugs or better to let drugs be legal like other commodities. And the libertarian conclusion, my conclusion, is it would be much better overall if drugs were legal rather than prohibited. I think legalization is better than prohibition for a whole host of reasons. Okay? In a nutshell, driving a market underground by outlawing it means that there's going to be more violence as people in the industry try to resolve their disputes okay, with guns rather than with lawyers and arbitration and things like that. Quality control will be worse in an underground market because people cannot easily patronize a, re a reliable supplier and so on. Okay, so more people will have accidental overdoses or accidentally consume adulterated substances. Prohibition leads to corruption because there's an incentive for those who are engaging in this activity to bribe the police, to bribe the judges, and so on and so forth. Prohibition breeds violence in other countries that are suppliers of drugs to other countries, such as country, Latin, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, and Latin America, or Mexico. Um, prohibition encourages reduction in civil liberties or respect for civil liberties and uh, protections against unreasonable search and seizures. Why? Because it's hard to enforce a prohibition law because there's no natural complainant. There's no one who obviously wants to go to the police and be upset about the fact that these drug transactions are occurring. The seller of the drugs isn't going to go to the police and say, you should arrest me because I just did something illegal. The buyer of the drugs isn't going to do that. So the police have to use much more invasive, aggressive tactics of buys and busts, of knocking down doors in the middle of night, of using you know, uh, unnamed informants, and so on. That's all very well documented in the US history of prohibition. 
prohibition in almost inevitably leads to much more racial profiling and much more oppression of minorities uh, because any tendency for law enforcement to be prejudiced at all is much more easily expressed when you have a victimless crime where a police officer can say, gee, that person over there looks like someone who uses drugs. I'm going to stop that person and frisk him and harass him and so on and so forth. And that pattern plays out every single day okay, across the country in the United States and many other places. All those things are not the results of drugs. They're the results of drug prohibition, of making the commodity illegal. What are the possible benefits, if any, of outlawing drugs? Well, the attempt, the presumably the goal of the prohibitionists, is to reduce drug use. And prohibition may reduce drug use to some degree, but the evidence suggests it's a pretty modest effect. And finally, many economists and certainly most libertarians would say it's none of the business, government's business to decide to reduce drug use. It's my business if I want to use drugs or your business if you want to use drugs unless you're doing it in a way which is clearly harming someone else, such as driving a car under the influence. Then whether drug use is good or bad for your health or good or bad for your own ability to earn income or anything like that, that's not the government's business. And so reducing drug use isn't an appropriate goal in the first place. The only thing that might be an appropriate goal for government is reducing use of drugs in a way which harms innocent third parties. It's not obvious that legalization would generate a substantial increase in wealth. Mainly what it would do would be to change who has that wealth. Because the drug production, distribution, consumption is already occurring for the most part. So it's just not being counted in the official statistics. So if we make it legal, the drug traffickers will tend to lose profits because there will be more competition for, their, for the activity of, buying, of producing and selling drugs. Okay, so that will be a shift from illegal traffickers in Mexico to Anheuser-Busch or Miller Brewing that might go into the marijuana business. It's not obviously going to create a lot of net wealth. It does allow the government to tax production and sale of drugs. Okay, so that allows the government to have a more neutral tax system, okay, to keep rates lower. That's beneficial. And it avoids the cost of enforcement. It avoids the additional, the unnecessary police, prosecutors, judges, prisons that currently arise out of the attempt to enforce drug prohibition. So libertarians think about what should be the government's business versus not the government's business by asking, essentially, which things will get done in a reasonable way if they're left purely to individuals, and which things might not get done well at all, or at all if they were left to individuals. So for the vast majority of activities, of goods and services, of choice of profession, of education, of spouses, of religion, of whether to consume risky substances, of all those things, libertarians would say, of course, some individuals make bad choices. Okay, there's no doubt about that. We all make some bad choices almost every day. But most of those bad choices are pretty small. We have ways that we can recover from those bad choices. If instead we get the government involved in deciding which substances are risky and which substances are not, the government is imposing one policy on everyone, even though it's not the right thing for everyone. It's a perfectly fine thing for many people to consume alcohol, to ski on dangerous mountains, to drive on the highway, and so on and so forth, even though for a few people that would be a really terrible choice. Okay? On the other hand, we have a very small number of activities, national defense, where it's very hard to see how the private sector, purely private decisions, would protect the country from attack okay, on its own, unless the government intervened. Why? Because imagine I thought that you were going to create an army and protect the country. Well, then I wouldn't want to bother to pay for that because you were already doing it, and by the virtue of the fact that you were doing it, you'd also be protecting me. But then if you think the same way in reverse, that if I organize this army and protect the whole country, I've ended up protecting you, so you don't want to engage in the activity of raising this army and paying for the army and protecting the country. So this is an example of what economists call a public good. It's a good that no individual will supply on his or her own because everybody else will free ride, will take advantage of that and not contribute to funding the public good, to paying for the public good. So there are a few examples of things that genuinely are convincing as public goods. National defense is the textbook example, is the classic example. Libertarians don't think there are very many others, maybe not, maybe not any others, but certainly not very many others. 
frequent question in thinking about government interventions is whether they should be helping individuals, whether they should be helping businesses, whether the owners of businesses have the same rights and freedoms that deserve protection as the individuals and so forth. And it ends up being a little bit messy in most of the popular discussion because a lot of popular opinion thinks of businesses almost as inanimate objects, not as being owned by people. So standard economics suggests we should be much more careful about that. If we impose a tax on a business, if we impose a regulation on a business, yes, some of the effect will be on the owners of the business, and the owners of the business may on average be wealthier than the typical person in the society. So that's why a lot of people think that we should just tax businesses more, regulate businesses more, not worry about the profits of the businessman, and so on and so forth. But that's a very narrow and probably incorrect view in most instances because the people who bear the burden of the regulation are not just the business owners. Okay? Indeed, in some cases, they're mainly not the business owners. They're the people who work for that business and they're the people who buy the products of that business. So one standard example is a corporate income tax. If your country has a corporate income tax substantially higher than similar countries, then lots of owners of capital, the people who want to invest their funds and start businesses and operate businesses, will say to themselves, gee, I might as well locate in that other country with a low tax rate instead of in this country, but that's going to reduce the demand for employment, the demand for labor services in your original country, and that's going to hurt labor, not capital. Okay? If you impose a tax that raises the price of a product that's purchased by people of low income and middle income, then that tax is not just hurting the business owner, even if that business owner is very rich, it's hurting all the people who purchase that product. So there's a lot of misguided policy in the standard economics framework uh, because we don't recognize that the true burden of any of these policies might look very different than the superficial burden, that the tax is not necessarily paid by the person who writes the check or the business that's subject to the regulation, the burden is borne by everyone who interacts with that particular business, the customers and the employees as well. So I guess I think politics doesn't create wealth or jobs for the working class because that's not what politics is about. Politics is about politicians trying to get reelected. They're acting in a manner which is self-interested Many, many people are acting in a way which is self-interested. I'm not criticizing self-interest per se, but in some frameworks, in some settings, self-interest tends to help everybody. In other frameworks, self-interest doesn't necessarily help everyone. It just helps the people in question. So politicians are going to do the things that they think get them reelected. Okay? They're not necessarily going to do the things which they think makes the economy most efficient, especially not over the longer term because they're not around over the longer term. They're only around long enough to worry about the votes from the next election cycle or the next few election cycles. Uh, so politicians create policies which are going to respond to the preferences of special interests, to the preferences of their voters right then and now, and that's what makes sense for the politicians, but that doesn't necessarily translate into good policy. I think lots of evidence suggests that people generally tend to put somewhat more weight on the short run relative to the long run in many, many settings. Okay? People undersave, for example. They don't think quite enough okay, about the fact that at some point, at a certain age, they're not going to generate enough income on their own, and maybe they should save more now so they have more to have take care of themselves in retirement. So that phenomenon, it seems to be fairly widespread. Whether it's extreme or moderate is a little harder to say, but it's certainly it's there. But for politicians, I think even if they are very forward-looking, they still are likely to res respond in ways which are not as necessarily ideal for the economy in the long run because they're thinking they have to get re-elected in order to be able to do anything good. And those re-elections come every two to four years, et cetera, depending on the system. And so you could convince yourself that you need to be in office for a long time to keep promoting good policies in the long time, and therefore it's completely rational, even from a fully long-run perspective, to do some things which are probably bad in the short run, and you know they're bad in the short run, but nevertheless are necessary to stay in office so you can do better things in the longer term. So politicians may be perfectly you know, farsighted that just the incentives they faced caused them to look as though they're being short-sighted. 
So libertarians are generally opposed to red government redistribution aimed at equalizing the distribution of income. It's not quite the same as saying that they're against anti-poverty programs. Libertarians would make a strong distinction between the view that we should be trying to compress the distribution of outcomes across the board, redistributing from the very rich downward toward the middle and lower, as opposed to the view that we basically ignore the distribution of income, how many people are middle class, upper middle class, rich, but we do care about people who are very poor. Uh, the people who are very poor are in that condition for mainly for reasons beyond their control and that they maybe have a good claim on help from others. Now that said, libertarians are still really skeptical that government attempts to help the poor are very effective okay, and that you can do that without them morphing into redistribution programs which are not aimed at the poor, which are in fact aimed at the middle class. So the U.S. provides some illustration of that. In 1965, we adopted two new programs, Medicaid, which was health insurance for the poor, and Medicare, which was health insurance for the elderly. And most people who have observed and studied the history believe that had the, John, the Lyndon Johnson administration tried to simply adopt health insurance for the poor, very few people would have voted for it. It would not have been widely supported. In order to generate the income support for the poor, we had to also add income support for the elderly because almost everybody expects to be elderly or hopes to be elderly. And so we were buying off the middle class at the same time. A huge fraction of U.S. redistribution is not going to the poor, is not in anti-poverty programs. It's middle class redistribution in the form of Social Security and Medicare. So that's one perspective. We're not really focused on anti-poverty programs. If you could really limit redistribution to helping the very poor, I don't think that many libertarians would be completely on board with it, but they wouldn't object nearly as much. It's their objection to the huge amount of redistribution uh, that extends way over the income range. Now, a second thing many libertarians would say is, if there's going to be any kind of redistribution, okay, it should not be done at the federal level that the federal government should completely get out of the business and leave programs like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid to each individual state because that might lead to a much more moderate amount of redistribution okay, rather than the very expensive redistribution we have now, which is unfortunately on a path to bankrupt the economy. To me, the definition of wealth that I use in my own life is focused on three things, standard financial wealth, ownership of stocks and bonds and cash and houses and cars or whatever, uh, human capital, human wealth, that is one's ability to think, to work hard, to get a good job that would pay an income, that's another form of wealth. And then related to that, uh, your health. Okay? If you're, you can be brilliant but unhealthy and w might then still have a hard time earning a significant income. So I would count all those things as part of my wealth, and I would include the fact that members of my family okay, are healthy and happy and seem productive and all that, and that's part of my. But I think an even better term might be, how do I assess my own well-being? Okay, I think assess my own well-being partially by my financial wealth. It's nice to have income and, well, and money, there's no doubt about that, but it's certainly not the only thing. And so having a job that you like, having children or family members who are happy and productive, and feeling like you can do something in the world that's productive and rewarding, those are all part of your happiness, your well-being. I think it's probably way too strong to say that any person can become rich. If by rich we mean Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or Steve Jobs or things like that. Some people have very serious physical illnesses, mental illnesses, other limitations, uh, sometimes from birth, sometimes imposed by family members, sometimes by society in the form of discrimination, other bad policies. So saying anyone can become rich seems way too strong. Can a large fraction, a very large fraction, attain some reasonable level of material success? Yes, as long as the government doesn't interfere too much. But in the libertarian view, the government interferes quite often in many, many ways. One of my colleagues at the Cato Institute named Brink Lindsay talks a lot about uh, what he calls regressive regulation, the kinds of regulations which make it harder, especially for low-income people, 
to start businesses, to compete, to have access at a reasonable price to the services like legal services, medical services, and so on. And most economies have tons of that, okay? and that definitely is an impediment okay, to most people in trying to achieve, say, a middle class existence. If you talk about regulation and try to find a big effect on the overall economy, I think you have to try a long time because most regulations affect only certain industries or only certain activities. And so their effects are, even though significant for those industries, are still kind of small compared to the whole economy. Likewise, businesses are very good at circumventing all sorts of regulations. Okay? They realize that if they do things a little differently, okay, it costs them something to make that adjustment, but then they can pretty much proceed as if the regulation had not been in place. So I think it's hard to point to very many regulations which by themselves have a huge effect. It does seem to be consistent with the data that when the level of regulation gets beyond a certain point, when businesses start spending most of their time trying to finagle the regulation rather than to create new ideas, then it has an effect on the level of economic activity and economic growth. There are a lot of reasons why people, some people are rich and some people are not. There are a lot of things that go into success. So willingness to work hard, willingness to take risks, willingness to be patient, okay, to some degree, probably, I would guess, intelligence, all those things play a role. But accidents of fate, of course, play a role. If you happen to be born in the right country, if you're born uh, in places where discrimination is, is severe as opposed to places where it's less severe, that, of course, is going to play a role for lots of people. Um, so many things go into it, and the libertarian view is that government is making it worse, not better, by creating more factors that lead to inappropriate differences in income by leading more people to get rich because of the government rather than because of their own skills and their own hard work and their own risk taking. So an example okay, is barriers to entry into various professions. If you have to be able to go to an accredited medical school and pay a huge amount of money to become a doctor, that's going to make it harder for lots of people to become doctors. Okay? Whereas if you had a less regulated system, more low income people could enter that profession, they could apprentice, they could learn how to supply medical services without as much training and without nearly as much cost, and more people would be able to therefore earn higher incomes okay, with less government rather than with the amount we have now. It's also in some ways a hard question to define, to answer, because my children both have my genes in part and grew up in an environment where I was the person they were most my wife and I were the people they were most exposed to. So was it just that our genes went to our kids, or was it we taught them to be hardworking, or is the fact that we taught them to be hardworking also a function of our genes and is transmitted to them simultaneously by sending them our genes, and whether or not we'd been around, they would have had basically the same hardworking genes without the environmental reinforcement for that. There, I mean, I don't know the details. Again, this is not my expertise, so I wouldn't comment for the record on this. But I know there are lots of twin studies where they take identical twins, separated at birth, raised in different families. So that's a pretty good attempt to control for environment versus heredity, genes versus nature versus nurture. And then I think those studies find that nature plays a big role, that genetics plays a big role. But genes might also affect your ability to learn or your willingness to learn or your ability to combine what you've learned with other characteristics which are not as easily learned, such as working hard or not getting distracted or being patient so that you're willing to you know, work hard for 10 years to get a business to the point where it is profitable and things like that. So I think I personally don't know nearly enough about how that works to want to comment on that. I find it hard to think about what are the characteristics of successful people what, because I can think of examples that are on both sides of any given characteristic. So to take a sort of illustration, I've worked for some leaders who were extremely impatient, 
and extremely disrespectful of the people who worked for them. They didn't surround themselves with other really talented people who gave them good advice, who gave them strong feedback, who disagreed a lot when there was something controversial or where a new, different view needed to be in the room. They surrounded themselves with yes men. And I've also worked for people who were just the opposite, but were also very successful, who deliberately sat, surrounded themselves with other super talented people, thinking that being around all those talented subordinates could, would make you work better because you got good advice from a lot of people you were connected with. So both models do seem to work from time to time in the, you know, in the world. So I'm not sure I want to take a stand on what those characteristics are. It, do, it seems to be true that people's political views are somewhat affected by their experience. And when they get into the world of having a job and they see that their first paycheck doesn't really add up to minimum wage times the number of hours they work, but some taxes have been withheld, that sort of gets their attention. When you try to run a business and you have to deal with a lot of annoying regulation, maybe that tends to make you a little bit less receptive to regulation generally and nudge you toward a conservative direction. But there's also a lot of reverse causation in all that. People who are entrepreneurial, okay, who aren't going to want to be interfered with, probably tend to be the ones who open small businesses or go into those sorts of activities. So exactly how much that experience causes you to be liberal versus conservative, I think could be easily overstated. And if we look at the data, people who are high income and successful, many of them are liberal and many of them conservative. And the same is true okay, at other income levels as well. The Trump voters, okay, the stereotypical ones, who are lower to moderate income, you might have thought they would be liberal because they would want to benefit from the government safety net, but in fact, a lot of them voted for a president who was talking about uh, things which would hurt, be harmful to just that group. So those, those things that you raised play some role, I guess, but I don't think they're determinative. I don't think describing taxation as theft is useful. Uh, I don't quite know what that statement means. It's, it's mainly, it's often stated to make taxation sound evil, but not really address the issues. If you're a libertarian, okay, in the standard definition, you believe in some government. If you believe in having some government, you must believe in having some taxes because you have to raise taxes to pay for an army. You have to raise taxes to pay for judges and police and prisons and uh, courts that enforce contracts. So it's logically inconsistent to be a libertarian and believe in some government and yet think all taxation is bad. You have to accept that some taxation is a necessary evil, is, is just part of providing those services which libertarians think government should provide. So it's, libertarians would certainly agree that the level of taxation in modern economies is way too high, but that's because they think the level of spending is way too high. If you had much less spending, then of course you had much would have much lower taxes. Times of crisis are certainly a challenge for ideas of liberty and small government. People seem to have a fundamental desire for to fix problems, for somebody to do something okay, when the economy is going badly or times are going badly. And it's seems obvious to most people to look to the government to fix the problems, even though in many cases in the libertarian view, government caused those problems in the first place, so it's not obviously a natural to try to fix them. And that's something libertarians are debating all the time, is the fact that a lot of the government policies sound good because the benefits are sort of obvious, the benefits tend to be sort of immediate, and the costs are spread over lots of people. Costs are often spread over people who are not even yet born, so they're not around to protest that these costs are being imposed. And that's why we end up with things like our current entitlements, where we're paying benefits, old age benefits and health benefits and so on, to lots of people now who are happy to get those benefits okay, and ignoring the fact that somebody has to pay for that. And we're not fully paying for it now, so we're imposing it on our children and our grandchildren, but they're not quite around to express their you know, possible discontent with that. Uh, so that's a huge problem, and libertarians don't have a great answer. We just keep trying to remind people that there are no free lunches, 
if something sounds too good to be true, we can give everybody health and retirement benefits and nothing, everything else stays the same. It probably is too good to be true. That is, somebody's going to pay for it someday. As an economist, I certainly think that financial education is a great thing. I've certainly tried to instill it in my children. I indeed uh, have a group of seven children and nieces and nephews who are together a few times a year, and I put on little presentations for this group explaining how they should invest their money and what sorts of things they should do so they have a well-funded retirement and so on. Whether the government should be engaging in this financial education is a much you know, more subtle question. Given that government is currently providing education and choosing an educational curriculum, I would say financial education has at least as good a claim to be in that curriculum as a lot of other stuff which is in that curriculum now. But as with all other parts of the curriculum, libertarians get nervous that if you have government deciding this, you get a one-size-fits-all. If you don't get it quite right, if you have mistakes, you're pushing these mistakes on everyone. And so I'd still think I'd want to leave the choice of who does this financial education to private decisions, not to government decisions. So an example of how what government focus on education is potentially dangerous is this notion that everyone should go to college or that more education generally is almost always better. So it's now become common to read stories in the U.S. about people who have a lot of student loan debt okay, and are having a hard time paying off that student loan debt. And you see quotes regularly from people who took out this student loan debt. They say, well, everybody told me I should go to college. So I went, borrowed a lot of money and I went to college. But now I realize my college degree is in some field that's not very much in demand and it's not helping me get a job. And so now I've spent four years not earning income, building up lots of debts. Okay? Whereas, so those people were worse off as a result, perhaps, not in every case, but maybe worse off as a result of this advice that the government promotes, that everybody should get a college education, and the government reinforces by providing these subsidized loans and things like that. Whereas an economist would say the right message is everyone should choose the balance between getting more education, which has some costs and benefits, and not getting that, year of that extra year of education, which means you earn some income and you don't incur the cost of the education. And it's not going to be the same for everyone. For some people, it is college. For some people, it's more than college. And for some people, it may well be less or different. It may be vocational education instead of liberal arts education. So having the government say, we know the right thing to do and try to get everybody to do it, at a minimum, has some potential and significant cost, not just benefits. It's hard to pick a best book out of all the books that I've read, but one that stands out that I read recently is called Nothing to Envy. And it is the story of 10 or so North Korean refugees who managed to get out of North Korea, typically by going through China and then eventually making it to South Korea, about their stories and what happened to them and why they left. And it's partially interesting because it made me realize far more than I had known just how awful the economy is and the repression is uh, and the lack of freedom is in North Korea. I've I'm certainly aware it was terrible, but this book was just stunning and in how incredibly awful it was. It was interesting because of the conflicted feelings that many of these refugees had even when they got out. Even though they had make, made the choice to leave, some of them still felt bad of it. Some people apparently go back, okay, even to a place that's as difficult, as awful as North Korea. Uh, there's one anecdote, one piece of it that stands out in particular. This woman who was a doctor, she was educated. She was reasonably high up in North Korean society. You would have thought that at least the doctors in North Korea had decent food and shelter and clothing. But apparently this doctor had fairly modest physical well-being. When she walks across this river to get from North Korea to get into China, and she's been directed to go to this particular farm, and she sees a bowl of food sitting outside some little house or fence or shed or something that's got nice white fluffy rice and little bits of vegetables and meat. And she says, wow, that's so nice that these people who knew I was coming left this great food for me because it was way more appealing, apparently, than the food she was used to in North Korea. 
And then gradually she realized this was the food for the dog. And so the lesson was that the dogs in rural China eat better than the doctors in North Korea. On that, in a, you know, sort of summed up just how extreme the poverty and the deprivation and the dysfunction is in North Korea. So I highly recommend that book. I think the best advice I've received, I sort of got from a movie, but I also got it from my father. There's a scene in the movie Dr. Zhivago where this young woman has been told that she's the daughter of Dr. Zhivago, but the person who's telling her this doesn't have proof. He has suggestive evidence, and he says to her, don't you want to believe it? And she says, not if it isn't true. And the way my father trained me to think about everything was, don't just believe it, question everything, think about everything, challenge everything, even stuff that everybody or almost everybody accepts as the, the truth, the wisdom. And that's sort of my niche. That's, I really enjoy it, and I'm frequently wrong. Frequ most of the time, everybody believes something because it is true. But once in a while, taking that extreme skepticism of everything, I think, gives one a useful perspective and helps you sense that there's not as much truth-telling out there in the world as one would like to believe.